Thank you for having me here. Um, it's a pleasure for me to um, talk about uh, the Proteum Tools project and related things, mostly Prosit. Um, so I've prepared this for half an hour, um, but have, I guess, a bit more time now. Feel free to ask questions at any point in time in between, um, and then obviously also in the end. Um, mostly, um, this talk is about two things. As the title says, it's about Proteum Tools and Prosit. And it's in light of the new um, Proteum Discoverer version 2.3, which comes then with spectral library support. And um, both projects mainly deal with the issue of spectral libraries. And um, the Proteum Tools project, the initial publication of that was last year. A um, colleague of mine, also one of the sort of project leaders in the Proteum Tools project and me, um, which laid out the initial project of the Proteum Tools and then this one, I will talk about also half of the talk about Prosit stuff, um, which is in revision currently. So there, this is, I, I hope this will be published by January, latest February next year. Um, Spectra are at the core of what we do. Um, be it DDA measurements, be it MRM measurements, be it um, DIA, be it cross-linking, no matter what we do, spectra are the things we tend to look at. We either require them for, for setting up our acquisition methods or we require them sort of um, for actually understanding our data. So no matter what you do, um, spectra and partially also retention time are, are sort of the crucial, most interesting information um, which I, at least as a, as a bioinformatician, can get my hands on. Um, however, um, spectra and partially retention time, they, we really don't have yet a good clue of what they are and how they come about. Um, they are reproducible, so if we acquire spectra of the same peptide over and over again in different machines, they, they look rather similar. But for us, um, as humans, it's really hard to predict what a spectrum will actually look like. Thus, software tends to mimic what we do in the MATLAB, essentially. So we start out with a fast A file, and this gets digested with our protease we use in our lab. Um, and then we sort of generate with some mediocre information sort of a spectrum of this, right? So we just assume that every Y and B fragment, depending on your precursor charge, is just simply created and then score this against your experimental spectra and then hope you're, you're happy with it. Um, is it yeah. um, and that has been going on for, for 25 some years. Um, this is sort of the predominant workflow of how we identify things in, in, in mass spectrometry, bottom-up mass spectrometry at least. Um, there are different versions of, of how you can calculate scores, so I won't go too much into detail in this. Um, however, this entire workflow has a pretty big flaw in it, right? And this is exactly the step of these MSMS spectra. So how do we generate these spectra? This process actually leads to a lot of false positives. So if you look at this sort of um, comic example, so we have two hypotheses here. So the bottom, uh, the top one is an experimental spectrum. The same one, we have two different hypotheses. Um, just by looking at, this, at these two mirror plots, um, I have a really tough time telling which one is the correct one, which isn't. And I guess you will have as well. And they only differ in just the presence of one peak. It's a small peak, so we don't know whether it's noise or not. It's really tough for us to, to say which one is the correct one. And it's tough for MaxQuant, for Sequest, for any search engine. It's tough for Percolator to pick this as a, as a wrong match, if that happens to be a wrong match. However, if we actually have intensity information, this becomes sort of a clear-cut picture. Because this one looks all jaggy, um, and this one is sort of a perfect mirror of itself. Um, even though there might be a single peak missing, which is present in the experimental spectrum, that, but that might just be noise or something else. So if only we had our hands on these intensities in our, in our um, bioinformatics side and in, in, in the place where we try and identify peptides, that would come really handy because likely well, the assumption is that we can get rid of a lot of false positives by using the information we actually acquire. As of right now, we completely disregard intensity for most for the most part, we completely disregard intensity in MSMS spectra. Um, so an alternative mechanism then is obviously, and people have, have come up with this idea um, decades ago, um, to replace this entire, this entire um, mimicky um, workflow with spectral libraries. So we just collect our MSMS spectra and use those and score against this. So we have actually intensities in our fragment spectra. So this is nice. Um, 
This has been around for decades, as I said, but it's really not used that often. And this is because of some of the issues with which, which come with this. Um, these libraries tend to be incomplete. So one can use a library, one can, can sort of collect and start collecting its own library, but they always are incomplete. And whatever is missing in the library, you will also never identify in here, so your results will also not be complete, no matter what. Machines differ, um, fragmentation methods differ, machines differ in their acquisition settings and so on, so it's a bit tricky to actually use libraries required in any other lab for your lab, because the spectra just might look slightly different. Um, you should for sure use the same fragmentation method, but even collision energies and things like this might vary between labs, um, might vary between machines. Um, so that's a bit of an issue then. And also the, the question of how does one actually generate decoys in these spectral library searches is still sort of an open issue. Um, there are some heuristics available for this where people try and, and generate decoy spectra based on target spectra. And these seem to work in some cases reasonably well, in other cases they don't work at all. So there's a bit of an open question how one actually solved this issue of, of um, how do we estimate false positives when do, doing a spectral library search. Um, addressing sort of the, the comprehensiveness of, of these libraries is one of the big goals of the Proteum 2's project. The Proteum 2's project has been now going on for the past um, three years, roughly two, two or three years roughly. Um, and essentially the goal is to synthesize 1.3 million peptides and systematically acquire spectra of these peptides. These peptides um, are meant to represent the entire human proteome, um, at least in gene world. On protein world, this is a bit more complicated. And then if you go to, um, go to a sort of proteoform world, this is even more complicated, but as, as far as we can do within 1.3 million peptides. Um, the ultimate goal is then obviously to, to use these spectra, to use the knowledge we've acquired by doing this, to come up with tools and mechanisms to make um, life of proteomics people sort of easier, right? So to get more data out of what we actually acquire. Um, the whole process um, started with um, having sort of a draft of a human proteome at hand that um, lays out which peptides we tend to see a lot. So we can um, select four peptides which are so-called proteotypic, synthesize those. We know which proteins are missing. For those, we can just simply synthesize all peptides, do this on a, on a spot membrane. So this is a spot um, synthesis. Um, and then systematically acquire the spectra on, on a, a LUMAS, actually. Um, and then provide these spectra um, via multiple mechanisms. So we provide these in ProteomicsDB, but also these are by now already in Massive and NIST. And raw files are all available on Pride, so we try to make um, our data acquisition as open as possible, that whatever you need, whatever you want to get your hands on, you will get your hands on this. Um, these 1.3 million peptides are segmented into these bigger chunks in here. So we are talking roughly 500,000 triptych peptides, um, roughly 450,000 peptides which are actually modified. So we are talking phosphorylation, acetylation, UB, we have methylation in there, citronylation. Um, actually quite, quite a bucket of, of um, post-centration modifications. Also 250,000 HLA peptides, so this is class 1 and class 2 and a bit, of, a bit of a smaller chunk on non-triptic peptides. So this is um, two other proteases and um, peptides which harbor mutations which are frequently found in patients. Um, the triptych site um, will be released by early next year almost entirely, so this will be all available. Um, PTMs will come also within the next year, so within the next year all of this will be published. We are sort of currently in a bit of an, uh, in a backlog. Um, we, we, we can't really keep up in writing sort of what we discover and what we find um, in comparison to how fast we can acquire and synthesize these peptides. Um, so there, there is much more to come. Um, as of right now, um, there is about 60 million PSMs, high quality PSMs available, um, which boils down to um, roughly, uh, this is I think slightly outdated numbers, um, so, so the, the, our database right now contains in the range of 150 million PSMs, high quality PSMs, so these are identified spectra um, of about 600, uh, 800,000 peptides. Um, 
all these peptides which we have, which we are synthesize which are synthesizing they are we will also label the, them with TMT and dimethyl and reacquire the entire thing. Um, so there will be not 1.4 million peptides, but rather than 1.4 million times three peptides available and reference spectra for those. Um, and all these spectra, I think I don't have a slide on this here, all these, so the data acquisition is also set up in a way that we try to be as comprehensive as possible. So we do acquire CID spectra, HCD spectra, ETD spectra, ETHCD and ETCID. And for HCD, we go um, with six different collision energies, um, starting at 20, going all the way up to 35 in roughly steps of three, roughly speaking. So we also try to generate not only a single spectra per peptide, but actually multiple to get an idea of how the intensities vary across different sort of replicates of, of acquiring <laughs> spectra. So in total, we acquire five raw files per pool of 1,000 peptides. And by now, this has amassed about 250 days of constant LCMS measurement time, so without any dead time in between and nothing else. Um, so this has, has been quite a project. Um, it's going on. Machines are busy and, and heating up. Um, super, super interesting, obviously, from a, from, a, from a bioinformatics point of view, but also, I guess, from any sort of wet lab point of view. Ultimately, so, so and within this project, we've also looked at a couple of different, different other things. Um, one small thing to mention is that um, we have published last year also a small bit on, on a retake on the retention time peptides. So within the Proteum 2's project, we use our own retention time kit. However, this retention time kit is not only set up in a way to monitor retention times, but also collision energy differences. So what we've, what we've um, figured out over the course of these two years of acquiring spectra and trying to maintain high quality of these spectra, that our collision energies drift over time. So these get calibrated from time to time as well as retention times are. And, and these peptides um, which we have published, and they, they can be bought as kits, um, can be used to monitor and calibrate collision energies within or across different instruments, be it different labs or be it the same lab but also within the same machine. So we've seen that on our machine, we see small drifts on, on, on collision energy over time. And especially in the context of setting up targeted measurements, um, I think this is crucial to, to keep in mind that collision actually, colli the collision actually, collision energy has the biggest influence of how your spectrum looks like. Um, and this is sort of depicted here. So we have um, collision energy on a QE, on an effusion. Red meaning high correlation between a spectrum of this peptide. And we see, first of all, it's not a straight line, it's sort of bent. Um, and the fact that it's not a straight line and the fact that the red isn't on the diagonal even tells us that these machines don't acquire this, like physically the same spectra and the same collision energy. Some interesting um, thing we also discovered in this is that peptides seem to have these sort of breakpoints where they for some time fragment quite similar and then from one collision energy to the next they seem to fragment quite differently, um, which sort of makes sense from, from a physical or chemical point of view, I think. And if one acquires a data set like this, then one can um, generate these calibration curves and essentially calibrate collision energies across different <coughs> instruments. We've also released um, this year, actually, um, a, a set of peptides which were generated within the Proteum Tools project where we looked at 21 different post-translational modifications. So these are all listed over here. Um, these is as, as a small set of rather synthetic peptides, so they tend to be not endogenous. Um, but we just wanted to check and wanted to get an idea of how different post-translational modifications change retention time and fragmentation pattern of peptides. For most of these, no real reference data is available, so they, they, they tend to be rather exotic, at least I didn't hear of most of them before we started looking into this. Um, but there's, there are some, some interesting results in there where we, where we are able to set up a, a, a linear model, basically counting atoms in post translational modifications, which tell you at which place to look for your modified version of your peptide, um, because there's this, for most of the modifications, they increase retention time or they add a constant delta to retention time. And within limits, this also tells us whether we can reuse the spectra we have acquired of the unmodified peptides. 
So if these violin plots, so we have again a spectral angle here, which is a measure of how similar two spectra are. So the closer to one, the more similar they are. Um, we can see that for some modifications, the modified spectra and the unmodified spectra of the same peptide look fairly similar. So when, for some of these modifications, I, I would actually argue it's, it's fairly, fairly safe to assume that one can use the unmodified spectrum and just transform this by shifting the fragments to the correct MZ place to a sort of modified spectra of the same peptide. Not the case, though, for citronylation, melanination. Um, there's more, more information in the paper if you want to check on this, or otherwise come to me. So obviously then the next thing would be cool. So we have this like super high quality, comprehensive um, Proteum Tools spectral library available. So we replace our own spectral library with Proteum Tools um, and then we are good to go. Well, kind of. So we, so we are more comprehensive, likely more comprehensive than, than what a single lab can do in any point in time. Um, we have acquired spectra at different collision energies and different fragmentation methods, so we are quite okay and with regard to um, transferability to different machines. However, we still have sort of this issue of the decoy generation, so we can still only just take target spectra and sort of transform them into um, decoy spectra, which comes with a handful of different strings attached. I um, won't go too much into detail specifically here. Um, so, but this is, as of right now, I think the best we can do. So, so synthesizing 1.4 million peptides has been quite challenging. Um, digesting a human proteome, um, looking at variable number of miscleavages, you res the result is sort of in a range of 5, 10 different million peptides. If one wants to do all of them in different versions of post translationally modified ones, um, this is a statistical combinatorial explosion, so we will never be able to synthesize literally the entire human proteome and measure it. So we need a different mechanism for actually being comprehensive, comprehensive. Um, so what we have started is um, looking into deep learning. So deep learning has been in the news for the past five years quite often. Um, I think latest science paper just in the last release um, on, on deep learning. Um, so we've started looking into this because, because we thought so we, for, for, for sort of the first time we have a comprehensively acquired large data set on spectra. So Pride and so on, obviously they, they store spectra for the past um, 30 years, but they come from different machines and different qualities, different settings. So this is, uh, this is rather heterogeneous data set which is hard to align and, and make comprehensive to actually do learning on. So because of this Proteum Tools project, same machine, same synthesis, same, same processing methods, it's a rather homogeneous data set and it's big, it's big enough for deep learning. So we actually set up a, a neural network which um, receives precursor charge, collision energy and the peptide sequence as input um, and then does its magic and literally deep learning is magic and um, nobody has a clue what's going on in there. Um, and then what falls out is either fragment intensities or retention times or prototypicity or charge or cross-section or whatever. And we've done this, I will now specifically talk about the fragmentation and the retention time here. Um, because if one does this and lets this thing train for a couple of days and the first version actually took a bit more than a month to, to train. By now we are down to 20 hours because we are able to tweak things a bit. Um, we, we, are we are in a situation like this. So you see again on top an experimental spectrum and on the bottom you see the predicted spectrum of that um, deep learning thing. And I have a hard time differentiating those. They pretty much look exactly the same to me. And this is also what we see if we do this on mass, so if we do this on 130,000 peptides and look at the um, spectra we've acquired in the Protein Tools project and the spectra we predict with POSIT, um, we have a distribution which looks like this. It peaks at a spectral angle of 0.95. And a spectral angle of 0.595 doesn't probably tell most of the people an awful lot, but this is roughly speaking a correlation of 0.998. Pearson correlation. So it doesn't get much better, I would say. So it's, it's ridiculously good. I'm actually, I'm actually super hyped about this. Um, it's even, so there are, because of deep learning, there are some biases in there, so it's not equally good for all peptides. 
So because of the synthesis, um, the synthesis um, protocol we use um, synthesizing short peptides is quite easy. Synthesizing long peptides is quite difficult because errors in the, in the sequence, uh, synthesis accumulate over time. So long peptides are underrepresented in the Proteome Tools project because of those reasons. So we have a lot of short peptides and this is why our, our prediction of short peptides is really good. The prediction of long peptides is a bit worse than on short peptides, but we are still talking a, a spectral angle of 0.8 in this area, which is still a Pearson correlation of 0.97 or something like this. It's still significantly better than anything which sort of is out there. And one of, one of the most um, prominent other tools for predicting what, how spectra look like is MS2 PIP. Um, and you see the difference between, between the orange and the green bars. Um, one big advantage is that we have acquired spectra at different collision energies. And I keep saying this, that collision energy is quite important. Um, so we look at the spectrum um, of this peptide um, acquired at collision energy 20. We got a max score of 166. Um, and we actually see this is a double mirror plot, so it gets a bit confusing. We'll just focus, so for, the, for the sake of time, just focus on the, on the big peaks anyway. So this is collision energy 20. Um, on the bottom now, this is the same peptide, but different collision energy. They look nothing alike. So they share some peaks. So this B3, for example, is shared, and then there might be a Y10, 2 plus over here, but most of the other peaks are actually not shared. So collision energy has a big, it has a huge influence on, influence on how spectra look like and how they appear. Because we have um, systematically acquired um, um, spectra at different collision energies within the Proteum Tools project, and, I've, and as, as I've shown you earlier, we have also used collision energy as input for the neural network. We are actually able to predict spectra at different collision energies. So the model, the neural network, actually learned how spectra look like when using different collision energies. And this comes super handy because what we can do now is we can, we can take an, an, an external data set so this is a Becker Janssen et al. data set. So they have looked at a cell line with multiple different proteases. Um, and now we can use, um, we can predict spectra, adjust the NCE which um, they have used for data acquisition. And we see that um, the, the uh, um, peptides sort of have a, a spectral angle of 0.7, five-ish in that range, that still appears in correlation of 0.9. So still really, really good. Um, but not as freakishly good as I've shown you earlier. However, when what we are able to do now, because PROSET is able to predict spectra at different collision energies, we can check at which collision energy we should predict to get the best results with the external data set. Because their normalized collision energy 33 might not be our normalized collision energy 33. So we just check at which collision energy we have to predict and predict at the one where we get the best results. And this is sort of our normalized collision energy after calibration and we sort of see a, a big increase in, in spectral angles. So we um, get a sort of mean um, spectral angle of 0.85-ish in that range. So again, we are well past that 0.95 Pearson correlation range. And what's really interesting um, to me is that if you, if you focus your attention on this blue bar, so this is peptides we've predicted with the correct um, normalized collision energy, which are also present in the Proteum Tools project. So we can also look at the spectra acquired in the Proteum Tools project and look at what the correlation to the external data set of those spectra is. And we actually see there's a slight difference between the medians, so the, the black bar in these um, box and whisker plots. So the prediction is actually slightly better than what we have actually acquired. And that sounds, I guess, even more freakish because how can we predict stuff better than we are actually in, in sort of acquiring this? Um, but it makes sense um, because the spectra we've acquired, we can only acquire them at distinct collision energies. So we've done 20, 25, 28, 30, 33, 35. But 30 or 33 might just be barely off of the actual data set at hand. Because of PROSET, we can predict at any collision energy we like. We can choose 30, 31, 32, 33, 35, 40, 21, we can choose any. So we can actually calibrate the spectra precisely to the machine. 
This is why we are actually slightly better in, in predicting spectra than actually using the spectra we've acquired. Um, PROSIT is actually only trained on triptych peptides, so exclusively triptych peptides. However, if you look at different other proteases, so blue, bluish line is LYC, um, purpley line is, is chymotrypsin, and then we have glue C in there, we see um, they all sort of peak at the same collision energy. So this is our calibration plot. So we have to predict at a slightly different collision energy as the uh, collision energy used of, of, for acquisition. We see that um, all these different lines, so for different peptides, they peak at the, roughly the same place. So the, the model is consistent. But even more interesting, even though we've only learned on triptych peptides, POSIT is also able to predict what spectra of non-triptych peptides look like. Quite well, actually. So we are still talking um, spectral angles in the range of 0.7. And again, this is a Pearson correlation of 0.9, um, higher than 0.9, so still freakishly good because it has never seen a non-triptych peptide. It has actually learned sort of how fragments, uh, how fragments are generated of a peptide using HCD. Um, so and these are just the same, same plots for the different proteases again. Um, obviously, the next step is then, well, let's replace a sort of spectral library we've acquired with spectral libraries we predict, right? So because now we can actually be so, we can predict whatever we like, so comprehensiveness is gone, so at least for unmodified peptides as of right now. Um, machines differ, well, we can predict at any collision energy we like, so that's out of the, out of, out of the um, issues list. And actually, we can predict decoys, right? Because we can predict any peptide sequence we like, we can predict any peptide sequence we like, so literally also decoys. So we can just reverse our um, sequences we got on our target space and just predict what the actual spectrum of that decoy would look like, right? It's, it's, we don't have to take a target spectrum and have to manipulate it and move it around and, and fiddle with the intensities and stuff. We just predict what the actual spectrum of that peptide would look like. Really cool. So all the, the, all the main issues, and obviously I choose the issues such that I could erase all of them. There are some, some left. Um, so how does it look like now? So if we stick it into sort of a database search, so what we can do is we can rescore what um, MaxQuant or MassCot or Sequest or any other search engine does. We can use this and predict what the spectra of these, of these um, peptides would look like rescore this with PROSIT, so attach spectral angle to this and a couple of other things, and just rerun Percolator again with these new scores. And what happens is, um, you see different versions in here, but focus your attention on the red one and the blue one for now. Um, we see the red and the blue one are really not that differentiable in this plot, so we're looking at a false discovery rate of, of 1% um, of like 200, 75-ish or 300,000 um, PSMs roughly, there's not much of a difference. So there's a marginal gain of like 4%. It's really not worthwhile talking about. Um, but what's interesting, if you go to higher and higher FDR cuts, um, we see the red curve actually drops down quite drastically. And this is typically what one sees if we, are, if we filter more stringently, we sort of reduce our number of identified targets quite drastically. If we focus our attention on the blue line, this one stays rather constant. It starts to drip down sort of in the end, but even to the point at 0.1% FDR, we still pretty much have exactly the same number of identified peptides as before. Which is nice, because we can filter at an order of magnitude more, or more stringently than before without losing any target IDs, without losing any identified peptides. We can go even go to two orders of magnitude, um, more stringent filtering, and we only sort of lose in the range of like 20%, 15-20%. And this reduces the number of false positives drastically, right? So we, we, are, we are shaving off 99% um, of our false positives. And I think this has huge implications because we've been talking, so we as a community have been talking about going into clinics for the past five, 10 years, and especially in clinical proteomics, being confident, being 100% confident that in what you identify is actually correct matters because that might change a person's life. So and I think in these situations, one has to think about filtering differently to what we do sort of in classical basic research kind of proteomics. So we see we, we essentially um, are able to um, 
retain everything which MaxFont had. Um, we are able to stack a bit on top if you go to um, other FDR cards. But that is also sort of consistent for all different proteases. So if you look at trypsin, that's essentially the same plot. So if you look at the blue is the overlap, so we are at 100%. We gain a bit. Um, Lyse, um, pretty much 100%, we gain a bit. Um, chymotrypsin, most interestingly, we gain actually a lot. So we increase the number of IDs by 20-ish, 25%. Um, likely because um, Andromeda is, is sort of um, panned, optimized for triptych kind peptides. Um, what's even more interesting on the right hand side is if you filter at 0.1% with Prozit and compare this to the Andromeda 1% results, we still see that we are pretty much meandering around this 100% line. Yes, our overlap decreases a bit, but we still gain a couple of spectra, and this puts us again oh, above these 100% online. We can do retention time. Ah, yes. Um, for trypsin, we use the triptych cleavage sites in this case. Hmm? For chymotrypsin, the chymotryptic cleavage sites, yes. But in principle, it would be possible to um, uh, do a uh, search uh, across all possible Yes, yeah, so, that's in, so, so we can predict any peptide one likes. Um, there is no restriction on, on what the peptide looks like. Well, Prose doesn't care, a peptide is a peptide. Yes, yes, so I don't show this here, so, so we have done the same, same sort of analysis on, on an HLA data set. So Prozit only trained on triptych peptides and we did exactly the same but on HLA peptides, class 1 and class 2. And because the Andromeda score on any other major scoring system um, isn't very good in sort of these large search space scenarios, um, we actually see an increase in number of IDs um, in the range of 300%. Um, because we are so much better at differentiating what a good and what a random match it is, because we integrate intensity information. It's frightening. Um, on top of this, um, this POSIT architecture is generic, so we can not only predict spectra, but also retention time. So on the left-hand side, you see retention times predicted, plotted against the experimental retention times. We are talking about correlation of 0.99 again, um, numbers getting ridiculous, um, really tight window in comparison to SSR calc, sort of one of the other classical tools. We increase the, the, or we decrease the isolation window we would have to set up by a factor of five. Um, and obviously if, um, that also works on the different, different um, proteases again, so these retention time predictions again are only exclusively trained on trypsin, also work for chymotryptic, Lucy, Lysi, peptides. Um, won't go too much into detail what this refined stuff is. Essentially, this is the mechanism of um, calibrating Prosit to your LC. So for fragmentation, this is easy because this is mostly normalized collision energy. For retention time, this is a bit more tricky because the physical setups and everything else sort of differ between labs, so one has to be a bit more careful in, calib in, in sort of calibrating retention time predictions to a specific lab. But this is also possible um, and outperforms um, sort of a classical other way of, of doing this. Um, but being able to predict spectra and retention time now allows us to predict just plain spectral libraries because this is essentially the two big components what a spectral library contains. Um, so we have done this, so we've, we've predicted spectral libraries um, and then we are now in, in DIA world, so we've used Spectronaut and just compared how well our predictions perform um, against the experimental spectra people supplied with the publications. So we look at, uh, at um, first at um, hack cells, so we're talking humans, so the first bar is the original library supplied by the, by the authors, and then we first replace retention time, next we sort of only replace spectra, and then that last step we repla replace both by the prediction. And we see that replacing retention time 
doesn't really do an awful lot. We lose some, we gain some. Again, we are sit pretty much sitting at 100%. Same thing happens for if we exclusively only replace spectra. We lose some, we gain some, but we are still pretty much at 100%. And if you replace the entire spectral library with just a predicted spectral library, um, we lose some 4-ish, 5% or something, but essentially we are as good as um, the experimental library. This is true for different organisms, obviously, um, because peptides are just peptides, and POSA doesn't care where that, where that peptide sort of comes from, whether it's from C. elegans or, and we've looked at four or five different other organisms. Um, and this now is a different data set. Um, this is now a triplet of data set. And if we do the same thing on a triplet of data set, and especially this triplet of data set, we see that replacing retention time, again, we lose some, gain some, not really much, nothing worthwhile talking about. But if we re replace the spectra, we actually see an increase suddenly. And this is because QTOFs um, acquire spectra differently, right? So they are really sensitive, which is nice, but it's also really bad. Because what happens is that experimental spectra tend to look like this. So the signal to noise of these spectra tend to be really poor. So the spectra don't really contain the original relative intensities of the fragments anymore because there are simply not enough ions to represent a 27% base peak intensity. So we can, all, we can count how many ions hit the detector in these cases, right? So, um, and this is a nice thing about POSIT, and POSIT doesn't care about at which point in time a precursor was picked. The quality of the prediction is always the same. POSIT predicts at sort of 100% signal to noise. Um, so, and this is sort of the major, major reason why we actually see such, a, such an increase on this specific QTOF data set, because the original library um, was actually rather of poor quality. By replacing the spectra with predictions, um, we replace those spectra, those poor quality spectra with high quality predictions, um, and suddenly we actually find these peptides in the DIA data set. Last sort of major thing, obviously targeted proteomics, um, something worthwhile talking about as well. Um, without process setting up a targeted assay for a protein for which no major information is available in the public domain is tricky because you synthesize peptides, you spend a lot of money on this, you do it, and in the end you might realize that your, your protein is simply not present. Um, with PROSET, you can pretty much use a QC run and check, calibrate the collision energy and retention time to POSET. Um, predict spectra and retention time of the peptides you want to monitor in your targeted assay, do your assay, and if you find positive hits, go and synthesize only those which, which you actually found in your, in your sample. So it reduces costs, it reduces time, significantly reduces costs because peptide synthesis, especially purified peptides, is, is crazy expensive. Um, and we have done this internally but also externally, so this is data from the Seelbach group, and they have ex ex Especially, um, exactly done this, um, and on top the prediction, on the bottom, then afterwards the synthesized peptide. Um, so this one looks pretty much the same, this one pretty much the same, this one pretty much the same, and the last one as well. So they went in with predictions first, checked which peptides they actually can see and monitor, and then went for synthesis. There is currently still a bit of a debate going on in the community what a good spectral library format actually is. Um, there are multiple different ones right now. None of it is perfect, obviously. Um, but as of right now, we supply spectral libraries in MSP format, which is compatible at least with Mascot mm -hmm. and I believe as MS, MS Pep Search, so then Proteome Discoverer as well. And as a sort of CSV format, which is compatible with um, Spectronaut. So from our point of view, sort of, we support Spectronaut, Skyline, Mascot, um, Proteome Discoverer, these are the yet sort of four or five big software pieces which actually make use of spectral libraries. Um, Proteome tools, anyway, worthwhile checking out. We also um, hand out spectral libraries there if you trust more in actual spectra than predictions. I totally am totally fine with this. I'm a bioinformatician, I trust predictions. You're, most of you are wet lab people, you trust wet lab actual spectra, that's fine. Um, there will be much more to come over the next year. Um, it's, it's too much stuff um, for us to handle, actually. Um, Prosit um, will hopefully be available. Um, I think super awesome tool and actually influences all these areas in proteomics. 
There are, we have planned and already in the making a lot of extensions, so modified peptides are in, in the making. So the, you, over here you look at a phosphorylated peptide. Um, you see the greenish and purplish stuff if, if either the prediction or the experimental spectrum has too much intensity. Um, but again, we look here at a correlation of 0.96, so phosphor spectra prediction works fine. Same is true for most of the other major PTMs. Um, we look at neutral loss prediction, this is fine. Um, we actually have a, a neat trick. We came up with a neat trick to predict spectra at infinite resolution, so we can actually differentiate, differentiate how much intensity contribution came from fragments which have exactly the same MZ. It's again freaky. Um, and even more freaky, um, we've also um, looked a bit more into, into retention time prediction and set up PROSET in a specific way such that PROSET can predict retention times of modified peptides which it has never seen. So here we see a um, prediction versus experimental data of biotinylated peptides. PROSET doesn't know what a biotinylation is. It was trained on acetylation and a couple of other PTMs, but not biotinylation. It's actually pretty good at predicting these things as well. So within limits, one can actually predict retention times of things which we have actually never acquired. Um, really cool. Um, obviously not my work, um, mostly work of other people. Um, Daniel, Siki, Toby, Flo, Michi, Paduli. These are also the major people behind the Proteum tools and Posit stuff. Um, I'm, I'm only here of, of talking and telling you about the news about this. Um, big thanks obviously also to, to Thermo for, for being part of this project because otherwise that wouldn't have been possible. And with that I would like to thank you and I'm open for questions.